let's just talk about this condo thing. I don't care what you buy. If you're in your 20s, buy as much as you possibly can. I, t- I told this to a younger guy, but how do we get the money, Randy? How do we structure the financing? I said, I don't care. <laughs> Talk to your mortgage broker, care. build your team. I don't care what you buy. Yeah, by you hook buy or by crook. <laughs> buy as much as you possibly can in your right. 20s and your 30s, and you're on the right track. All right, we're ready to rock and roll. Randy Ramadan in the studio. How you doing, brother? And Mr. Christopher Hummel as well, too? Yes. Say, hey guys. All right. I'm amazing, guys. I'm really honored to be here, and it's a beautiful day. Thank you for having me. It is really nice. I can't believe, well, I don't know if I want to date this or not, but either way, it's hot, man, over the last two weeks. Yeah. And it's never like this. It's I can take like the this. sun every day. I love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, listen, I, I'm with you, son. I, I love it. I love the sun, but I just, I don't remember it being like this. And every year, it seems like it's just the weather's getting crazier global warming more wind you know more heavier rains i mean we see it all over the world where we are we don't see all of that mayhem and destruction like the rest of the world thankfully but i mean you certainly do see it yeah for sure it's so crazy yeah so randy what's been happening with you i mean i like i said before we had to well it's the second time we're starting this back up but anyways um you're a lot more on social media again you know and, and it sounds like real estate investing has allowed you to have the opportunity to spend that time with your beautiful wife and your kids. And now you're back on the scene again. I've seen you all over. Absolutely, Gary. Real estate is such a blessing to me being in this industry and uh, affording bricks and having tenants pay for those bricks has given me the flexibility to chase my dreams and achieve them and to be around in and provide sun and water for my beautiful children to let them grow. And they're growing to the point now where daddy doesn't necessarily have to drop them off to school every morning and pick them up from school every day. So it's given me some time to get back in the mix, meet with my colleagues, roll up my sleeves, start meeting people, doing deals. This is what I've been doing for 23 years, 24 mm-hmm. years. Right. Yeah. Look, I used to see you at a lot of the events and doing public speaking and you, I, I remember you did uh, uh, a sit down. I can't remember what show it was. It was BNN with um, Kevin O'Leary. Do you remember that, Chris? No, I don't. Yeah, I yeah, don't yeah. And that. he was talking about. Uh, I think you were promoting your your book. Wait Absolutely. a second. Wait, was Ra- hold on. Ra- Randy, big time. Yeah, Randy's big time. <laughs> <laughs> Call you big time, Randy. That's Thank you, now. you big sir. Time big Randy. time, Randy. Call me big time, Randy. <laughs> All right. Investing in condos was one of those changes in your life where there's an inflection in how I looked upon myself, Mm -hmm. my contribution to the industry. And uh, it was an amazing turning point in becoming an author. I have a, I have a legacy asset now that my kids can see. Sure. Dad wrote a book. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I argued with Kevin O'Leary on national television. (laughs) Yes, you did. (laughs) You did. Well, I think if I remember now, his position was that the condos cannot continue to keep going at the rate that they were going. And I think you were arguing saying they are and why they're still a great investment. That was back, what, in 2015, do you think? So, Gary, this is a guy that manages a billion dollar fund. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when you talk with a guy like that, he'll crush you like a cockroach on national television. Uh So I went into this studio thinking, okay, guys, we got to be prepared. So the first question he asked us was, Randy, why does anyone want to buy these cockroach motels in the sky? (laughs) That's how he positioned (laughs) You you remember that line, don't you? (laughs) I'll never (laughs) forget it because it hit me like a ton of bricks. Uh But you know what? I was prepared. So just like anyone in our industry, anyone who is an achiever, we're preparing. Mm-hmm. So we went into the interview prepared with stock market indice data, right. oil data, gold data, valuations over 15 years. And during the interview, we slowly changed Kevin O'Leary's mind. And at the end of the interview, he said, Randy, I guess Toronto condos are a good investment, which completely blew everybody away. Wow. Okay. Okay. That was pretty so, good. Yeah, you convinced him. I did. And he opened up. O'Leary Mortgages, started speaking on the investment show. He was at the multifamily conferences this weekend. Mm -hmm. So the whole world of real estate. Was he there this weekend? I know he was was a keynote speaker last year. Okay, I didn't know he was there this this year. Well, I thought he was there this year. No, I think it was last year. Oh, was it, it last was year? Grant Cardone. Okay. Yeah, it was Grant Cardone was there this year. (laughs) Oh, and Grant's the real deal. Yes. That... That guy is amazing. The yeah. king of raising money. The king of bricks for money. 
Mm-hmm. And the king of no excuses. Right. I love that guy. So let's talk a little bit more about your past, your history, who you are. And then I want to kind of dive into the whole condo market, what's been happening with it over the last, we'll say, you know, year or so. Oh, I'm and, so and whether or not they're still a good investor. I'm so interested. Yeah. I am so interested. Yeah. We got lots to talk about and assignments and uh, it's, it's, yeah. it's going to be a great talk. All right. So let people know who you are and why you're somebody that can actually talk uh, about this particular subject. My parents came from Guyana and Trinidad. I'm first generation Canadian and I grew up in downtown Toronto. And uh, academically, I was the guy that knew it all. I hit the books hard. I was featured in the Toronto Sun in 1993 as a top graduate in the city of Toronto. There was a film that got a Governor General's Award in 1993 featuring me among uh, three other graduates. It was called Yes, I Can, and it got a Governor General's Award featuring students of color breaking racial and financial barriers to get into higher education. So I got a full scholarship at the University of Toronto into the engineering science program, and I excelled really well academically. So when it came to books and studying and and whatnot, I was the guy. Wow! So you were you you been big time, Randy? Well, I mean, I, but this is from a guy who was a stutterer who okay, never really? spoke to okay. anybody growing up. <clears throat> mm-hmm. I was an extreme stutterer. Now, is is that is that kind of what kept you in the books? Absolutely, right. right. I think whatever God gives us as an in inability creates abilities. Isn't that crazy? So, I, 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 I 100% believe that. I've talked about that before because he, and Chris always had a hard time with this when I tell him this, like I hated public speaking. And you're like, what do you mean? I don't get it. I understand. Like it was just, it was my weakness. I absolutely hated it, but I just kept leaning into it. And I think that's what you're saying, right? You like, you just leaned into what you believe was your weakness to make it your strength. A hundred percent. So our weaknesses and our strengths, yeah. sorry, our weaknesses and our challenges, believe it or not, have built us. And I've now become grateful for the challenges that I've had. Right. Um, I grew up in a broken home uh, where we had challenges from a very young age. My mother was on social assistance and uh, we, she would come on with bags of really great goodies every Christmas. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize it, but she was going to the food bank. Right. So I grew up really grateful for these beautiful things that my country has given me the opportunity to uh, strive and excel and build. And now I'm a winning success story. At the age of 34, Rogers Television created a film about me. I've created a TV commercial featuring me from this film that I made when I was 17 as a success story in Canada. It was for Black History Month. And in that TV commercial, it said, people like me, I can watch them on television because we matter. So I'm really proud of that fact. I'm mm-hmm. a winning success story and 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 everyone's got a shot in this beautiful country, Canada. Yeah. All right. Okay. I agree. Right. Now, how the whole condominium thing came about, it was completely by fluke. I was talented and smart. I spotted an opportunity in pre-construction. I became a VIP broker with Concord City Place. And um, that led me on to being one of the uh, one of the fastest online marketers for pre-construction condos mm. when no one believed in it back then. Mm-hmm. We're talking 2005, 2006, 2007. That, so you started back then. I started back then. That's when crazy. Brad Lamb had these posters up of him on a lamb <laughs> and everyone was making <laughs> yeah, fun yeah, of him. Right, right. They didn't know who this guy was. So I started back then and uh, I just took this ride in pre-construction and it's, it's, it's worked out really, really well for me. Mm-hmm. And the book deal was a complete fluke of being someone who was passionate about real estate, someone who's well-educated and well-read, who could communicate a vision and come up with the book, who did really great sales. I got the book deal and I got the book deal from Wiley Publishing and that got me on a much larger stage. Mm-hmm. Okay. So let's talk about, I want to switch speeds here now. And I want to get into like the steps to buying a condo. So somebody's interested, they want to know how do I buy a condo? Let's kind of just walk through that. Like, where do they look? What does that down payment structure look like? Um, the length of time it takes to build typically. Like, like let's, let's go through some of that. Okay, Gary. So I know most people don't wake up in the morning and say, I want to own a condo. Uh-huh. I think they say, I want to own a home. Sure. So if we're in the providing roof business, where we put shelter over our heads and we want to take our family into their first home, provide a, a, a safe, clean place to live, 
it's we want to buy a home. Mm-hmm. Now the condominium story developed because when homes were six hundred thousand in two thousand and six, that was a big deal. Yes. They were expensive to get a bungalow in Toronto for six hundred thousand. That was a lot of money. But mm-hmm. guess what? You could have buy a condo for two bedrooms at two hundred fifty thousand. Right. Yeah. Can you imagine that? So for someone who is a first generation Canadian, someone that's new to the country where you want to stop paying rent and buying your first place, a home wasn't an option. But you didn't want to have that one hour commute out to Brampton because Brampton was all farm fields. Oshawa was all farm fields. Highways were not where they were. You had to commute an hour and a half. So if you wanted to be in this city and make it work, the only way you could afford to buy something was to buy a condo. Right. So that's the, how the condo started. Uh, the condo story started. It yep. was the first timers' opportunity to buy their first place. It was an opportunity for downsizers to be able to buy something smaller. So I think, think that that's why condos make sense. Right. And uh, and at the time though, they weren't really investments, right? At the time, they. I mean, maybe to some, but for the most part, it was like you said, just a home, right? People couldn't afford it. Well, for me, when I got it. I got into it in 1997. I bought my condo for 120000 Yeah, Wow. Well, that was my home, right? So I wasn't even thinking about an investment. I was just looking for a place to put my head right. and, and, and to raise my family. Right. Right. But back then, I thought that was, that was stretching my limits as well, too. Uh, right. I was only making like 20-something thousand a year. My wife was making, you know, 20-something thousand a year. Mm-hmm. But that's what we could afford. Yeah. It's the first timer story. And condos were always that first opportunity to get in the market. And- there's this whole financialization in real estate now where it's now become an investment class. Mm-hmm. So this is where investment condominiums have completely taken off to a different stratosphere. Right. Yeah. Now, what about the down payment structure? How does that work well, typically? Like, do they have different ones? Well, would you get 20% down? Can you do 10% down? Well, obviously with um, CMHC, they're the Canadian Mortgage Housing Corporation. It's allowed first-time buyers to buy under half a million with as small as 5% down. Okay. And that's been an, an, an amazing opportunity for anyone to buy their first home. Now, tell me, what can you really buy in Toronto for half a million bucks now? Today, no. It's a bachelor condo. Yeah, yeah. If if you're lucky to get actually if, one bachelor, if right. you get in. What's but the smallest right that they can do now? They're, they're somewhere around 300 square feet now for I th- bachelors. I thought, though, wasn't there a time when, and I don't where some of the banks were not insuring them, not even insuring them, I but think loaning. That's still the same. Where it's they won't loan. Yeah, well, Quentin, Quentin was just telling me about that the other day. Well, right. I don't know, maybe he was telling you the same thing. No, I didn't hear about that. Yeah, he said he was doing some deal and then the lender said no because it's too it was small. too small. Yeah. Right. Yeah. There was that time that is going to change if it hasn't already. Lenders see condos as liquid. Lenders are looking at whether or not they can take back that property and actually resell it. They're going to resell it. Okay. Yeah. Now, what about home inspections? Do people do typical home inspections on condos or is it, you know, what's it called again? Pre-delivery inspection? And what's the difference? Really great question, Gary. So just the fact that we have Terry on warranty and most builders have really great customer service. I tell buyers within that first five years, you're doing the home inspection because it's your comfort. So when you take a look at insurance and comfort, that home inspection for 250, 350 bucks, Best investment you can make in knowing that what you bought, you feel comfortable with. So I tell first-time buyers, best insurance you could ever have. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. You let them know. Go ahead and and do the inspection. Absolutely. Do it. Because when you take a look at what what is covered under your condo insurance policy, Mm -hmm. everyone who buys a condo pays into a common elements policy. That's part of their maintenance fee. People don't realize that's just for the standard unit definition okay. and the common elements in the hallway. So everything from that drywall and back, yeah. the kitchen counters, the floors, the light fixtures, everything else is not covered. Mm-hmm. That's yours. You mm-hmm. got to deal with it. Mm-hmm. All right. What about um, the cooling off period? There was actually an article that came out as well too out in BC where they now have three days for cooling off, right? when you purchase a home now i believe that's for resale homes that they've introduced that for did they have they have that for condos they've always had that for condos didn't they i want to say i shouldn't say always but they've had it for a very long time it's mandatory cooling off is 10 days in ontario okay for new for pre-construction condos correct now what you're talking about is what's happened in vancouver where they're actually passing mandatory cooling off periods even for resale so firm 
can't happen anymore in right. Vancouver. Yeah, They're yeah. working on mandatory cooling off periods. What are your thoughts on that? And and do you think that'll happen here in Ontario? Um, that's an interesting question because the fact that an offer is firm from a seller's perspective, I've got a real buyer. They're not backing out. We're selling it tonight. It's a done deal. But in, from a consumer protection standpoint of view, buyers need to make the right decisions. And I'm one of those agents that insist to my buyers, especially if they're first timers, you better get an inspection and you better get a mortgage commitment. This mortgage commitment thing where realtors are forcing people to go in with waiving that condition without dotting their I's and crossing their T's, realtors need to take some of the some of the backlash to that because they're pushing these things and do they realize what they're committing their clients to? Yeah, what do you think, Chris? Well, I'm thinking about the uh, three-day period, uh, uh, what do you call it? Um, the cooling off. off period in BC. But I think there was some restrictions to that. I think it wasn't that you could just walk away. I think there were some real restrictions on that. And I don't have the article in front of me, but uh, I remember reading it some time ago and it wasn't just, you know, okay, no, we don't like it because I don't know. I don't like the paint color anymore. Got it. You know, take off. We're gone. I think there was some real restriction with that because at the end of the day, it is, you know, it is still a, a legal binding agreement. Absolutely. So there's something involved there. I, I, I can't remember what it is. But I do agree with you as far as the whole firm thing. It's it's really tough, you know. Now, listen, let's be honest. If, you're, if your client is insistent and you have done the back end work, because as an agent, we we really should be in control of the deal, right? I, I, I know for us anyways, we we really try to control what's happening and we really, ins at least I insist on meeting the mortgage broker on all of my deals. I insist. I don't care if it's the bank. I don't care if it's a broker that I'm not familiar with. Hey, just, just let me, let me pick up the phone. Let me say hello. Let's just have a chat. Why? Because we're on the same team anyways. Right. And I want him to know him or her, whatever, to know me. And I, I want them, I, I need to know them. And guess what? Who's to say we're not going to do another deal together? You, yeah. you like meeting people. I love meeting people. Absolutely. And it's the same thing. So now, now not only am I making a connection, I'm controlling the deal. And, and I already know what they can and can't do approved for. So, yeah. so I just jumped into the article here. So it says well, the province says, yeah, go so ahead. So Chris, right I'm glad you said that. Because in our business, there are transactional agents. And then there are fiduciary agents. Y you're you right. You are a fiduciary that's what I am. I fight fiercely for my clients' rights. Right. And for me, it's the lifetime of the opportunity to see that family or that person grow and build their wealth. It's not just one deal. So I'm glad you actually said 100%. that. 100%. And especially the business that we're in, myself, Chris, and Quentin, like we're working with our clients for years, potentially right. probably even decades. And this and, is not just a one transaction for us, some of our tr clients are doing five, six, seven, ten multiple transactions. Right. So that's probably what it boils down to. Without, you know, honestly, you're and you're right. Without even thinking about it, you know, I, I never really thought of a transactional and okay, you know, uh, just do do the deal. So I guess just as a result of the business, it's just it's and that, I guess it's why that's my style. I you know I never and, even thought about it to be honest. And I jumped into the article here. So in regards to the penalty that you were talking about, it says the province says buyers who back out of a sale within mm. the three day period will be hit with a cancellation fee of two hundred and fifty thousand for every hundred thousand of a home's purchase price to ensure transactions are taken seriously. Oh, so, sorry. So two hundred and fifty dollars for every hundred thousand. Oh, two hundred and fifty dollars. Okay. I see. Yeah. Right. Okay. So so now you it's bought something. You bought something for a million. Right, so that's uh, two fifty times ten, so right? So twenty five hundred. Yeah, it's not a lot to walk away, but I mean, it's something. It, it's, it's enough to. It's like, an incentive, right? Yeah, it's a vacation. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, maybe for one person. <laughs> maybe. All right, cool. Um, and then anything else on that? Just on, on like on how to purchase a home, the down payment, well, cooling well, up well, period. Hold on, hold on. Yeah. What, what about what about Will this come here to Ontario? The, the three day cooling off period, you know, with some type of a little penalty? That's a great question. I was just at a pre construction launch, just to give you an insight that's yeah. what's happening in Ontario. I was at a pre construction launch in Oshawa uh, for a major home builder, 
and they were still insisting that clients do firm agreements of purchase and sale okay. at the sales office that Saturday. Okay. And I told my clients straight up, we're not doing this deal. Hmm. They're like, Randy, but what if I'm interested? Which which happened? Were they, they weren't. Mm -hmm. I said, I refuse to let you get in that situation right now. Never mind, I'm going to make this commission. But to put you under the fire, well, I know your position. You're not prepared. You're just here to see the opportunity. You didn't talk to your broker. I didn't have that pre-approval in my hand. I know how the banks look at you. We need to make sure that we dot our I's and cross our T's because this is what put a lot of investors in hot water in the condominium 100%. market. Is that kind of mentality? Yeah, one hundred percent. I I agree with you one hundred percent. So let's dive into that then. Yeah, let's talk about the state of the condo market. Um, there's there's a couple articles I do want to jump into. So there's the first one here is a surge in new condo occupancy presents assignment sales opportunities. Let's touch on assignment sales. What does that mean? And, uh, and, and why are so many, whether it be families or investors that are in this particular situation? Basically, Gary, an assignment sale or an assignment contract, the opportunity is to buy someone else's contract. Right. So it's an opportunity to flip someone's ability. They have purchased from a builder two years ago, three years ago, and a selling that contract today is an assignment of that contract. Now, um, it's a, it's a whole new industry because there's been a pre-construction boom in the GTA. A lot of these contracts are floating. And because of COVID, construction timelines have been doubled. Uh, I just posted on Facebook, I was at the launch of Nobu in Toronto on Mercer six years ago, and they still have not delivered. Wow, really? So we're on our seventh year of potential deliveries happening in the next seven months, in, in the next 12 months. So buyers who bought expecting to occupy in 2021, 2022 are still waiting. So sometimes they really have say, listen, I can't wait. Mm -hmm. My kids are now 15. <laughs> They're not like 12 and, uh, you know, 12. I need to go and buy a house now. Sorry, we have to flip this contract right. and, go and, and go and buy the house. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um so, okay, so we know what the assignments are. Assignment is effectively uh, flipping the contract, right? E effectively. Flipping right? the contract, selling the contract I bought, from I a bought, seller's point of view. I bought, I paid on the contract 600000 and I can't wait anymore, so I'm going to sell it to you for six fifty. You got it. Right? Yeah, something like that, right? Um, or I can't wait anymore, and I'm going to sell it to you for five fifty. Does that happen? Mm. <clears throat> I was, I'm having a lot of conversations as of late about this. So if you bought five years ago, your contract's got profit. Let's just be real about it. That's True. long enough. True. The market's gone up enough. Your profit, your contract has profit. You're not going to sell it at a loss. Right. How you structure that profit and when you get that and how you structure how deposits are going to be held from the assignee's point of view, mm -hmm. that's where the lawyers come in. Mm -hmm. Now, if you bought in the last 18 months, the last 24 months, mm. not only are people having to sell for zero profit, right? meaning they're selling it for exactly what they bought it for. Some people are having to dip into their pockets and give up some of their deposits. So they're not giving up real cash that's, that's uh, to actually make this deal work. This yeah. is deposits being held by the builder. Right. They're giving up to make that deal work right now. Uh, or, or now can they walk away? You got my deposit, you know. Builders go. have always said this. If you do not close or follow through with your commitment, we're going to sue you. Okay. Now, over the last five to seven years, when they sold you something for 500 and it's worth 750 and you're walking away from that $500,000 right, contract, right. is the builder really upset by you walking away from a place that you bought for 500? No. no. Not only will the builder take your deposit of 50 to 100,000, they're going to resell for 750 and they're sitting on profit. So the builder's not going to do anything. Yeah. But we're in a market now where some things are possibly less than what you paid for 18 months ago. And the builders have the legal right to pursue you for that loss. Mm -hmm. Undeniable. Uh, so then, okay, let's talk about it from the seller standpoint. So the okay. person now who bought this condo in the last, say, 18 months, okay, uh, it's it's lower than what they purchased it for. Yes. What are some of their options? How, okay. do, how do they potentially either offload this property if they just want to get out of this deal? Because you can't, you can't put this listing, or sorry, you can't put this assignment on MLS. Well, let's talk about that. How do we market these assignments? So builders have traditionally put in there 
restrictions on yes. how you can market an assignment. Now, most contracts come with what's called an assignment clause saying mm -hmm. you can assign with builder permission. But marketing that assignment, builders have always put in there mm -hmm. saying you cannot list it on the MLS without our permission. If you can, if you do, you can risk you buying it. Right. And we'll take the unit from you. You'll risk financial penalties of thousands of dollars. So within the assignment community, the brokers have been the people talking and sharing. It's typically been a tight-knit group. Now, there have been some builders that will police these broker networks and find their units in their buildings and pursue people that have been trying to assign their contracts mm -hmm. and threaten legal action against them. Why? If you think it from the builder's point of view, mm -hmm. the builder needs to protect the integrity of their buildings. Right. They need to protect the fact that they haven't sold to a certain level. There's a threshold. So typically past 70%, 75% when the builder has sold, their construction financing is approved. The builder will then allow assignments and make that happen. But if they're at 65% sold and someone is competing directly with the builder, mm -hmm. possibly selling it less than what the builder is doing, affects the value of all the other 100 buyers that bought, he's mm -hmm. going to pursue that person and say, you should not be actually marketing that only to your friends and family. Right. Take it off the MLS. So there's a lot of interesting techniques and strategies that realtors have been doing. I don't know if you've seen this, where they're not allowed to market it. Realtors have been known to list and terminate within 24 hours so okay. there are signals on the mls i've seen that i've seen that there are signaling so what's really interesting from a buyer and investor's point of view i watch that signaling that signaling tells me prices tells me agents and i call that agent up six to 12 to 18 months later and say you still have that have that deal they say mm -hmm. sure let's talk mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so they're sending up red flags using MLS, which is the most powerful marketing tool in this country. Right. Hold on a second. A so that's smoke. illegal or illegal? That is not legal. Okay, but they just the throw builder, it out there and get rid of it. Bingo. Got it. So the instructor agent, and the agent knows this, and the agent knows that they have a client that's motivated. The agent wants to get the best marketing. Yeah. They will list it and terminate it. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, it's still sitting oh, so there. So this is one of the tricks, right? <laughs> that's interesting. So I actually look at these smoke signals. These are smoke signals mm -hmm, up in mm -hmm. there, right? There's a lot of signaling. In our business as realtors, that business of being able to advise our clients, we must look at signaling. Mm -hmm. When it looks at when it comes to financing and interest rates, we talk with our mortgage brokers. They tell us where the rates are going, where the opportunities are. Right now, the really big trends are new immigrants, work sure. permit financing, PR financing. If we're not looking into these things, how can we advise our clients on deals? Mm -hmm. When it comes to pre-construction, signaling is important. Driving by the site, concrete's being poured, construction crews doing work or not doing working. We want to get a sense. And, right, right. and they're telling their clients, yeah, you can occupy in, in six months. No, no way. No, Forget yeah. that. Now, it's I've still seen, I'm pretty sure I've seen some websites out there where you can actually go and register to now be on a list of assignments. Oh, well, we so, get those all day, <clears throat> don't right. we? So is that legal or is that illegal as well too? They're not supposed to. But what these websites say, and um, they always say this, we do not take any of the legal liability of these advertisements for simply an opportunity for a closed network of professionals mm -hmm. to share their deals. The reality is Facebook has become an amazing source for right. these types of deals to be actually shared. So it's becoming tougher and tougher for builders to police these networks, yeah. but, there are, but the opportunities are, are out there to get these deals. Right, so mm -hmm. now these builders probably have people out there signing up for all of these different websites to see if any of their condos potentially are on that. 100%. And yeah. if you own a pre-construction condo that you bought five, six, seven years ago, and you want to make a profit and post it on these sites, beware mm -hmm. that you're risking that profit. Right. Because the, the, the builder, builder can has a after. clause in their offer typically saying, we can rescind your contract. And maybe punitive damages, take your deposit if we mm -hmm. find you marketing your deal. Okay. Right, marketing. The so deal when you say now you can, however, you can get it into your close network of friends and family, you're saying now individually reaching out or calling people and saying, hey, uh, do you want to buy this condo? I have That's a condo. That's the intent. That's the intent. Of those clauses is friends and family and people that you know. Right. Got it. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, who pays the HST on the assignment? So let's say now I am able to find somebody who I can assign this condo to. Who pays the HST on it? 
HST is a loaded question. It's something that I always advise my clients to talk with their lawyers about, but let's talk about this very complex topic. So typically when you buy and sell a resale home, HST, there is none. Right. There's no paying any kind of HST, uh, except when you're buying properties that have appliances and they have a certain size, shadows and HST apply, but that's, that's something for bigger deals. Mm -hmm. Now, when you're buying any kind of pre-construction property, there's always HST. Now, the boilerplate clauses in these brand new contracts state, the builder states, you agree you're buying this property to own or occupy, therefore we will claim your HST rebate for you, and there's no added HST to your actual contract of sale. Mm -hmm. That's in every pre-construction boilerplate contract. Now, if you buy that property as an investment property and declare to the builder upfront when you're buying that contract of sale, when you're buying that pre-construction property, you're gonna be the builder typically states, you acknowledge at closing, HST is your actual closing cost. Right, right. Now, the question is, what if, you're, what if your intent was to occupy that condo when you bought it six years ago? And now you want to assign that contract. Well, according to CRA, under the guise of the act, your intent was to buy it, to occupy and be an owner. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't pay HST. But the rules have become really different here. This is where intention matters, interpretation of the Income Tax Act and, and, mm -hmm. uh, and whatnot. And the government has clamped down on this. They've recently implemented brand new rules regarding capital gains tax. Yes. Saying. Yes. And this has become punitive for assigners. People don't realize this. As of January 1st, 2023, if you are assigning your pre-construction contract, did you know that your profit cannot be capital gains anymore 100 percent business right we we had um, right been talking yeah so about it's this. active now yeah it's now a hundred percent taxable so therefore this profit that you thought you were making that you only mm -hmm. have to pay half of it of tax yeah it's all of it is now taxable mm -hmm. so it's huge implications for the assignor yeah so yep. it's because so i'm telling people do whatever it takes to close even if you have to pay that 18 percent private money you know why that tax bill that you're going to pay mm -hmm. can eat up all your profit you might yeah, as well just close yeah, on it. Right. Yeah. And then probably on top of there as well, too, there's probably um, an assignment fee as well. The assignment fees are typically being small fees, 2500 5000 7000 okay. You're looking at profits of six figures. Right. It's just the cost of, of right. doing business. And it's the builder's way of recovering their cost of the paperwork to get their staff to get that actually done. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and then what about then on the buyer side? What do I need to be aware of? Right now in this market, there's a tremendous opportunity to buy with your realtor's help. And people think, oh, I can go buy these brand new things and these floating contracts that are a realtor. With your realtor's help, something that's not on the MLS. Mm -hmm. So we've been talking about lack of listing inventory for the last 12 months. Yeah. There's this other market. And it used to be 10% of the market. If you want to buy in Toronto, I think it's upwards of 40% of the market. It's this shadow market there that's not on the MLS. Huge opportunity to buy something mm -hmm. that's not on the MLS. There's a whole new inventory class. Yeah, I, yeah, we will. We see that. Right. Yeah. And and so then I was a, as a buyer, I am now what? What am I doing? Am I now looking for realtors who are, um, you know, known in that market of condos? Am I just doing a Google search? Who am I reaching out to? How do I how do I you get just, in you front of these kind really of deals? a really good point, Gary, because we typically thought realtors we trade property on the MLS and we help people buy on the on on the MLS. But just like on the commercial space, where you and I both know, commercial realtors are very specialized. Yeah. There's this off market thing. There are agents that are now specialized who understand pre construction. They understand the builders, the markets, the contracts, the market values, these uh, very specific clauses. And I pick out these realtors all day long when mm -hmm. I ask them about their deals and they don't know how to answer me. And it's because, like, okay. these agents are fairly new right, in their right. marketing. So you should be getting a realtor who understands all these pre construction opportunities. Okay. Um, I want to, anything else on this? on like on the buyer side the seller side assignments no i, th I think it makes sense for okay. for most yeah i, I want to touch on this one particular article that recently came out it says more than half of gta condo investors losing money on properties um the research from the canadian imperial bank of commerce 
And real estate research firm Urbanization found 48% of leveraged condo investors who bought pre-construction units to rent out were cash flow positive in 2022. But I think that's completely changed now in, in well, either late 2022 and in, in 2023. Thoughts on that? Are, are any of your clients in this particular situation and what are they doing? I am. Yeah. My clients are. So when people say, Randy, how do you find cash flow? I say, where do you find cash flow? And when was the last time you actually saw it? <laughs> now, I know guys like you, Gary and Chris, you find this stuff all day long, right, but right. they're in tertiary actual markets, yes. right? Typically. Correct. Or you're doing short-term rentals and creative structuring of deals within our, our markets to take advantage of short-term opportunities. Mm -hmm. But this concept of cash flow, having income coming in after making all your monthly payments, I tell people when you're buying a condo, what you're getting is safety and security and insurance, which mm -hmm. costs you money. My condos, they rent. I don't have to worry about the roof, right. the windows, the elevators or anything. And I have peace of mind mm -hmm. and my property is getting paid down by my tenants. So the concept of cash flow in condos, it hasn't existed for seven years. You know eight what? Years. You, you know what? I'll, I'll tell you, I'm very, very happy to hear you say that. I'm very glad to hear you say that. And <clears throat> not because, you know, we love cash flow, but but because it's reality, right? And and I think for us, we have a lot of uh, people come to us and they want cash flow. But wait, 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 I want to be in Toronto, and I need something to cash flow. And it just it doesn't happen. It it doesn't happen. We're doing real talk with Gary. Re a real talk, and I'm and glad to hear you say it. And they want to know where the actual cash flow is. Yeah. And and you know what? That's why I'm shifting out of my condos. I'm trading up some condos to buy ground-oriented real estate now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They're the upside. And Gary, you're the king of optimizing ground-oriented real estate. So condo investors, like I told you, they're starting out with these smaller asset classes. When you're a young person, you're not going to buy your first bungalow in Toronto now. It's 1.2, right. 1.3 million. Yeah. You're still buying that condo for five, 600,000. Mm -hmm. And in five years from now, when it's worth 800, you get your 300,000 equity and go and buy your first house. Right, right. So that's what you're doing yeah. now. So you're actually looking in Toronto to now buy Detach homes? Is that what you're kind of looking into? My personal or strategy, commercial. Yeah. I can tell you what I've just done. I bought a bungalow right next to Yorkdale Mall. It's my pride and joy. I learned mm -hmm. about construction. I was a general contractor <laughs> the hard nice. way. Nice, Boy, nice. I respect my general contractor so much more now after I've done it. Uh -huh. um, but uh, buying ground-oriented real estate, I knew what was happening in Toronto. I saw the homelessness problem, yeah. the lack of affordability in Toronto, my family is very close to that industry. My wife works as an officer for the city of Toronto in the shelter business. So okay, I'm seeing so what's happening. So I know the value of lots in Toronto. Right. So I said, you know what? I'm going to bite the bullet and buy one. And we had the garden suite bylaw that was going to be passed. Mm -hmm. So when I did my legal second suite, I gutted it and rebuilt all the services ready at the back of the house yeah. for the garden suite. Lo and behold, City Toronto Council just passed Four under units. Bill 23, a fourplex plus a garden suite, up to five units on a lot in Toronto. Is that what it is? Fourplex plus the garden suite. Four plus oh, one. Wow. Can you okay. imagine? And this is no more yellow belt. What that means is all those really rich foo foo shi shi neighborhoods yeah, preventing, yeah. I don't want that in my actual backyard. Yeah, yeah. This is the government pushing back and saying, no, you want to be in Toronto? Get used to it. Okay. We're doing multiplexes here. We have a problem with affordable housing mm -hmm. we need to get these people roofs over their heads yeah. yeah and i agree with it right i, I think it's a good move I, I i think it allows now for uh, we'll say affordable housing but it definitely allows for additional housing additional the, housing the additional the housing right um you know and and how long is it really going to take but but at least it's it's something right, right. moving yeah. in the right direction yeah but it ha it has to it has to go there, but but you're but you, but really you said it right. It's it's um available. What would you say? Additional additional housing. Right. It's not affordable housing. No. So no. This, come on. Right. And I mean, yeah. right, what what are you going to rent these each of these units yeah, out for? Like a on. one bedroom, maybe a two bedroom. You can squeeze out of it for what two thousand to twenty seven hundred dollars a month yeah. for some of these. So is that what you're planning to do with your particular unit that you have well, now? Well, okay. So I just came uh, back from one of the largest conferences, which is the multifamily conference. Mm -hmm. And how did I you like that, by the way? About it. How did you like it? It was awesome. Yeah? It was phenomenal. Yeah. And what happened here was I had a transformation in thought and I, I, I realized you've got all these investors chasing apartment buildings. And the reality is Toronto hasn't built any in the last 15 years. Right. Only now within the last five, the most wealthiest funds 
that are getting that are all equity, mm -hmm, no mm -hmm, debt service, mm -hmm. are able to build these things. Mm -hmm. So how does an individual investor like me, a first generation Canadian, participate in this? Well, you know what? Right. I can buy five or six condos. That's my sixplex. Okay. So this is how this is where the rental stock has shifted. Twenty years ago, you had a shot to buy your first apartment building for one point six two million bucks. That's mm -hmm, what I did. Mm -hmm. Mm, I did okay. that when I was 30 years old and I thank God that I did it. Right, right. But today to get your foot in the door in the GTA market to buy a six plex, an eight plex, a 12 plex, you're talking millions, two, three, four million dollars. You're not doing it. Mm -hmm. You know what? You start by buying one $600,000 condo, a second one for 700,000, a third one for 750. Before you know it, you've got a portfolio of condos, five, six, seven of them, mm -hmm. and they're not all in one building and you've become a multi-unit owner. So this is a new opportunity. And now with the new multiplex zoning bylaw, one bungalow, your family saves up. I bought my first bungalow when I was 46 years old. <laughs> and that's how I started. Right. And I put a lot of money in it and now I can possibly build it into five units. That's right. how you, that's, that's the new multiplex owner. Right in ontario so okay yeah so to summarize you're going to now sell off some of your condos and now you're going to get some some ground units bungalows and convert Absolutely. these things into multi-units i mean i think i think it's a great strategy yeah i do right you're, you're essentially going from green green homes to red hotels essentially absolutely <laughs> <laughs> right yeah. all right um anything else on this particular topic you're talking about condominiums or we're talking about yeah, condominiums, affordable housing? Yeah, affordable housing. Let's talk about because, that. Because then I want to get into who are some of the top condo builders out there. So mm -hmm. we'll touch on that after this. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's talk about this. Let's talk about affordable housing. Mm -hmm. And this is the part of the business that realtors don't really talk about because we're in the business of commission income. We mm -hmm. want to sell things and make our checks. But the reality is we need to provide more accessible housing for families to start off in Toronto. How does the federal government expect us to have 1 million new immigrants and have them work in our restaurants, in our cafes, in our schools, clean our floors, do everything else, and yet drive two hours into work to make 16 bucks an hour? Mm -hmm. It doesn't work. It's mm -hmm. a broken model. So affordable housing is the next model of building and what I'm working now is I'm working on structuring the capital stack with developers to allow them to build affordable housing and to participate in that. Well, well what's what's affordable housing to you? And what, what's your definition of affordable housing? Affordable housing in Ontario right now under the MLI Select Financing Program for CMHC, oh, CMHC which is for okay, apartment yeah. building owners, yeah. is I believe um, the 80%, average rental right? income for a two-bedroom in that marketplace. Okay. Um, I, I, I believe it's 60 to 70% of that. So right now in, in Toronto, you're looking at about $2,400 for a two bedroom. Okay. That's affordable housing. Is it is it that low? The 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 M, or is it the MLI program, right? Are they suggesting 60 to 70%? It's not 80%? Something, somewhere, oh, somewhere, somewhere there. Somewhere in there? Okay. Somewhere around somewhere those kinds of ratios. But, it, but it's yeah. not market. It's, it's, it's definitely not market, market. rents. Yeah. If you can, mind you, there's negative pushback on rents right now. I don't know if you guys actually know this. People are saying, oh, rents are going up and they're skyrocketing. Okay, talk to Do us. Do you realize in 2023, we have the largest condominium completions in history in the city of Toronto? Why? Uh, Over the last three years during COVID, we've had construction delays right. after construction delays. Right, right, there is right. a glut happening. So it's a fast and furious market of a lot all of supply. All at the same time. Right. So there's negative pushback on all those rents right now. Yeah, okay. right here in this article here, it says news that a record number of new GTA condo units will be ready for occupancy in 2023, nearly 32,000, according to research firm Urbanation. It mm. is a fast and furious competitive market. I'm looking to rent my bungalow right now. I'm seeing that competitive market. Mm -hmm, I'm seeing mm -hmm. how I have to sharpen my pencil, lower my asking rents. And it's a very different tenant composition. The type of tenants that you can rent to, right. their income levels, they're usually brand new in the in the country. The traditional underwriting of those tenants, looking at their histories, yeah. isn't there anymore. You're right. What, what you was, right. Do you know what the typical number is each year? I don't know what that number is. For? Well, for, well, saying what, 32,000 oh, oh. coming on it's, this year. The yeah. highest we've ever seen in previous years, it was 10,000, 12,000. Okay. And I think it's going to be more than 32,000. By what year's they're saying end. there does not include all the pre-construction homes in the 905 regions mm -hmm. coming 
to actual completion. There's a lot of product coming online, Gary. Yeah. And it's extremely tough. And I think we're kind of starting to see some of that as well, too. Like, you know, you had a lot of investors that wanted to flip last year. A lot of investors that want to flip. And because the numbers didn't make sense, they end up having to hold these properties right. and then rent them out. Right? Mm-hmm. So this, so there's, you know, I don't know what that number looks like, but that's a, an there's, additional. There's there's I, know, I know many investors that I know within our own pool of yeah. investors that are doing that. Well, well. well or, or just having added additional units. Mm-hmm. Right? Even that. So now you're adding additional units, right? What what did the city say, uh, Peterborough? What did they say? They said 80, they're just, just this year up to now, I think they're working on 80 uh, permits. Right? You remember that? So, yeah. Yeah, something like that. And that's just, that's just you know, I think that was April. Yeah. Right? Oh, that so, was from the last webinar. That and that we was one of the last ones that we did. So, yeah. and that's and that's a tertiary market, right? So now you've got uh, all of this other completion coming in at the same time. So, I, you know what? And I'll be, I'll be honest with you. I see it as well. I see the exact same thing because I've got a couple of properties that, that I've got that are vacant. And, and I'm just not getting the same traffic. Absolutely. I'm not getting the same traffic. And the pool of renters Fear. is just the num they 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 can't I mean, I gotta be careful here with the you yeah. know landlord tenant <laughs> board. Right, right, right. Right, but, right, right. but but they're just let's just say let's just say they're they're not the they may not be the ideal candidates. True. Right? That's the caliber. You know, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, realistically the income level isn't there. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, this is what's happening. So when you bring in all these new immigrants into the country, they're looking for housing. They don't have a credit bureau. Mm-hmm. They've been here for three months. They only have $40,000 in the bank. And you, you, they want you to trust them with your $700,000 asset. Sure. And it's four of them and their friends living together. It's not a nuclear family where typically mom's cleaning the floors, kids are going to school, dad's fixing things around the house, he's cutting the grass. It's four, it's four 20-year-olds that are working, living hard, have no desire to clean the kitchen or the floor. So it's a mm-hmm, different mm-hmm. dynamic that's happening when it comes to tenants. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, you know what I think it is? I think, I think rents have gone up so fast and so much that the 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 guys who would tend to move the ones that have the incomes they might tend to move but they're not they're staying put bingo and the ones that are still circling these are the guys that you know they're still circling for a reason right and let's just talk about this hidden market that people don't even realize the government i don't know if you know this the city of toronto declared a state of emergency this month okay the state of emergency saying our homeless problem has gotten out of control. There's right. a homeless epidemic in have, the GTA right have now. Have you seen Vancouver? Is it, is it like oh, crazy? Oh, there's a whole documentary on oh, it. Vancouver man. is a shit show. Yeah. Well, it's I'm, bad. Sure, it's it's bad. Yeah, I'm and, sure the states, everything, everywhere. Right. Yeah. And we think it's only apartment building owners. But guess who's subsidizing half these tenants who aren't paying? Guess who's subsidizing them? Well, you are. Our investors with their tenants and not paying them rent. Sure. We have become the news subsidizer of tenants that aren't paying rent. Well, and it's not being spoken about in the media. How many clients do you know that aren't collecting rent from their tenants? They're out many. there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And here is mm-hmm. one of the here's what we're starting to see as well, too, is that some of these investors are starting to sell their properties and move to other province or move out of country. Mm-hmm. That's 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 what we're seeing. And we know I, that. I literally just talked yeah. to one this morning. I'm like, hey, reached out to him. I'm like, what are you up to? How's the family? How's everything mm-hmm. going? How's your investments? He goes, oh, I sold all my investments here. Uh, I'm it down. Matt, I'm, was it? I'm, no, it wasn't Matt. <laughs> like, I'm down in uh, I'm down in Florida right now, yeah. and, mm-hmm. and uh, I plan on staying down here for a few months out of the year. And the the rents make so much more sense. Yeah. And uh, I don't have to worry about these tenant issues. I just want to share this quick thesis with you. Yeah. The capital stack has shifted. Over the last 15 years, debt has been 2 to 3%. Mm-hmm. We have now doubled that cost of debt. So as a result, the shift of debt to equity to own rental properties is no longer there. Right. So it doesn't make sense right now under the current rental rates to buy rental properties for rental sake. They will negative cash flow on you. Mm-hmm. So how do we make things work now? I'm looking at this from my buyer's point of view, investor's point of view. My buyers say, I have $150,000, $200,000, Randy. What do I do with it? Mm-hmm. Before it was, buy a rental property for $800,000, break even, and it will eventually get better. Now, it's 
$200,000, you're negative for the next five years or seven years. I don't mm-hmm. know. So now there's a shift. So I'm focusing on working with other larger developers that are using debt service free equity okay. and buying into their projects. So this is the new way to restructuring the capital stack, participating in larger players mm. that are getting government financing, zero cost money and equity at zero cost okay. and buying into those projects and participating with them. And yeah, what are these co- projects? Well, these are builders and developers that are typically non-prospectus investments, mm-hmm. which are typically allowing investors to participate with them. So there are some well-known names out there, like Graybrook. Mm-hmm. Ever heard of them? Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay. So they're a player that allows you to buy into their condominium developments with some of the biggest players in this country, like Tridel, like Fernbrook and others. And the ROI speaks for themselves. And the builders take on their biggest risk in development is that development risk. They take on that risk and allows a small guy with small as $25,000 to play in that pie. Okay. Mm-hmm. So that's what you're kind of focused on as well, too. So, yeah. you, so you're doing some land stuff and then you're also um, allowing these larger players and builders to then be able to leverage your funds to give you an ROI where you don't have to deal with tenant hits. I'm it, working headaches. on... Exactly. So my okay. investors who are smaller, who have two hundred thousand dollars, it's a different conversation nowadays. Before okay. it was, let's get you in a pre-con home. Let's get you into a pre-con condo now, and and let's get that six hundred thousand dollars in debt, and let's get right. you qualified. Mm-hmm. But that debt has now gotten so expensive. Now it's like let's just invest that two hundred in something. Let's see what we can get you twenty five percent a year on that two hundred. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, and look, mm-hmm. I, I think it's a good move, and I mean some of our investors have moved into that space as well sure, too with sure. the other side of our business, which is, is deep pockets and private lending. And, and it's just a great way to open up additional doors for investors who, look, I, here's the way I always look at it. I think it's great to get into a property in the beginning. That's where you really build the wealth. And then that lending is where you kind of create that cash flow. And we as brokers can now participate in this space by bringing land and development opportunities to these players Mm -hmm. in private equity Mm -hmm. and on the money raising side. So we we understand development, land and upside. Let's start bringing those deals to players who have the money because there's a lot of money sitting on the sidelines seeking ROI. Yeah. Interesting, yeah. Um, Let's shift into the last topic, which is who are some of the, the, the top builders out there? Who are you know, whether it be the top three or four that you like, that you've invested in. If somebody's listening and they want to invest in condos, who do you think those builders are? There was a list that I printed up and I have to just use this list. But okay, mm-hmm. the gold standard in our industry is Tridel. Okay. We all know this. Sure. Tridel, they built the most number of condos, the gold standard. Um, I love... Uh, Concord City Place. Okay. Concords are wonderful mm. for me. Um, what about Daniels? Daniels. Wow. How they've changed the landscape for first time buyers. Their first time buyer program is amazing. They've allowed people to enter into the space and buy their first place with the smallest 5% down. They're even doing if it's 5%. They're doing 5%. 5% for their first home program. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Right. And they're actually coaching people on financial literacy. If we think about it, what doesn't stop people from buying their first house is the money. It's the financial discipline of understanding how to use their current money to shift it to become a homeowner. Hmm. You're not going out on Friday nights every night for the next six weeks. You're going out once or twice a month on a Friday night and saving all your party money for this down payment for the space you're buying in, right. in three years. It's a different mentality about how we spend our money. It is. Mm-hmm. It really is. You're right. So what advice then would you give somebody that is thinking about getting into the market for the first time, whether it be their first home or whether it be their first investment property? What's that advice you'd give them? You got to be listening to the real talk with Gary. <laughs> <laughs> the plug. Because Gary's the plug. gotten guys like me and Chris talking the real deal, but what's happening in the marketplace. So you need to educate yourself. Mm-hmm. Do not buy blindly. Right. Spend a few months, read a few books, watch some smart people, go to some launches, learn about the different products out there because the market changes, I think every four months, every quarter, the market shifts. Market shifts into buyer market, seller market, incentives and opportunities, understand those trends. But what you need to be working on day in and day out is do you have that 
money mindset? Are you putting money aside every single month? Mm -hmm. Are you working on your RRSP? Are you talking with your CPA about how do you save that fifteen, twenty thousand dollars in taxes here? Are we doing all that homework, all that stuff that is in the background to get you home ready? That's the most important stuff. Working closely with your financial planner and your mortgage broker, they're just as mar- they're just as a, a part of this team as your real estate broker. Yeah. So that's that sounds a lot like discipline to me. Absolutely. Right. It's like going to the gym and lifting that weight. Yeah, you, yeah. Being a homeowner is, it's a different way of spending your money, managing your money, mm-hmm. and becoming a really smart person with your money. Yeah. yeah. You, you know, when I first got into it in 2008, I did it because this is the, the, the switch that happened in my, in my head was this. I have no other choice because I was going to be left behind. And I think if you, if you get into that mindset of like, if I don't get into real estate, then I'm gonna be working for the rest of my life. That was it. And I was like, okay, now I'm gonna educate myself. I'm gonna do whatever I need to do. If I gotta beg, borrow, steal, mm-hmm. I'm going to do it. And, and that's what I did. But, but, okay, but why did you choose real estate in particular as yeah. opposed to, I don't know, anything else out there? Yeah, good question. So here's the reason why I chose real estate was because it was one of the only things that I realized and saw that was outpacing um, inflation. Mm-hmm. Number two, it had bailed me out three times of all the debts that I accumulated over the last eight, nine years, uh-huh. three times. And I was like, if this thing bailed me out that many times, what if I had one more? Uh-huh. Now, I didn't have the education yet, but I knew that there was something in this real estate. And I always remember my dad saying this, man, if I had some money, I'd buy some land. Man, if I'd had some money, right. I'd buy some land. Right. And he always said that, but he never did it. And I'm like, there must, there must be something there. And I was like, I'm gonna start buying land. Mm-hmm. And that's what it is. It's not so much the house itself. That's depreciating if you don't look after it. It's yeah. the land. Yeah. That's where the value is. And that's where I think people need to understand. Mm-hmm. You need to buy land. That's yeah. why they call them landlords. Lords of the land. Yeah. Well, so, so before, people would be buying the house. You know, the land, you know, came with the house, but you'd be buying the house. And, and now, it's the opposite, right? You're buying the land, and who cares about the house? I mean, you know, you care about it, but really you're buying the land, right? And you know this because you can take that same trashy bungalow, right? Not your bungalow. Your your bungalow is really nice. (laughs) But, but, you know, grandma's bungalow in, I don't know, name your place, Timbuktu, Ontario, and it's going to cost you $250, $350, whatever, $400, and you drop that thing downtown Toronto. Different ball game. Same house. Yep. Different land. Totally different ball game, right? Yeah. So you're really buying the land. Yeah, go and then go drop that in Manhattan. And go drop it in <laughs> Manhattan <laughs> right along right along changes. Central Park or yeah. whatever. Yeah. 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 Totally you, different you ball. Go up game. A couple million, right? Um, Randy, listen, we're getting right close to the end here. Uh, a couple more questions. We're gonna wrap it up. What's the biggest mistake you've made? Randy don't make mistakes. What are you talking about? The biggest mistake I've made. Or mistakes, you know, like what were some of the things you look back, man, I should have done this, or man, I should have done that, or And how you got out of it. This actually uh, came in a joint venture. And uh, the biggest mistake I made was trusting $50,000 of my investor money in a joint venture for which I didn't have control. What ended up happening out of that deal was, so I was doing larger joint venture deals where we were pooling capital as deposit funds to go tie up buildings. Mm -hmm. The moment you pool funds with somebody else and you're not in control of those funds, we as real estate brokers, we have control of our clients' transactions. When we become a client, another broker controls that money. And the biggest mistake was I learned I didn't have control of the broker on the deal and we lost that $50,000. You lost the 50? We lost the 50, clear. Wow. Yeah. I've also seen, so joint ventures and partnerships can be beautiful things, but I've seen them uh, go sideways very quickly if they're not managed properly. So working with partners mm-hmm. is a very important craft and skill to go and build wealth. And it's very easy to make a folly on those kinds of deals. Mm. All right. Um, best day of your life? The best day of my life? When I married my beautiful wife. Yeah. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> you, don't have a, you don't have a choice. And you I have hope to. she's listening. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say this, as a father, yeah. as uh, a man of God, as someone who's proud to be who I am, if someone asks me, what is the one thing 
that has made me who I am today? Mm -hmm. What is the one thing that helped me to win? Mm -hmm. It's picking the right mother of my children and the white woman of my home. Yeah. And she has built the rock steady solid foundation for me to win, my children to be beautiful and happy. And I'm so grateful for this woman. Oh, yeah, listen, nice. man, what do they say? For every strong man, there's a stronger woman behind him, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. they, Randy, if yeah. anybody wants to learn more about you, um, how can they get a hold of you? Randy at condoinvest.ca. Reach out to me at any time. Awesome. Chris, anything nice. else you want to say before we wrap it up? No, but it's been really a pleasure uh, hanging out. You, you got some you got some good stories um uh, lots i'm sure lots more to tell you know and, and yeah i i really appreciate it. and and for all the listeners i i think we had uh you know some good insight today um and and i don't know who knows what direction that that the listeners are going and they may totally go and you know against your grain right now and just jump into condos but at least they have some background at least they've got some knowledge now from you and and they can go and make their own decision, right? Yeah. You know. So, well, like you said, just educate yourself, right? Thank you. And and let's just talk about this condo thing. I don't care what you buy. If you're in your twenties, buy as much as you possibly can. I t I told this to a younger guy, but how do we get the money, Randy? How do we structure the financing? I said, I don't care. <laughs> talk to <laughs> right, your mortgage broker, build care. your team. I don't care what you buy. Yeah, by you hook buy or by crook. <laughs> Yeah. Buy as much as you possibly can in your right. 20s and your 30s, and you're on the right track. It's uh, That is true. All that right, we're going to finish it with that. Buy as much as you can. Yeah, that's Beg, true. borrow, steal. Randy, awesome having you in here. Chris, thanks for co-hosting. Co yeah. And I will talk to everybody next week. Take care. All right, bye.